Okay. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Arjen Lynch, and I'm going to be talking about Drupal and InfoSec Assurance. Now, that's a very broad and lengthy topic, particularly the InfoSec Assurance bit. And that's why I'm inserting a bit of humor and just giving you an overview. And then I hope to have at least about five minutes open for questions. And after that, you're most welcome to, to contact me over email, Twitter, um, phone calls, you know, whatever, whatever you like, um, whatever suitable. But the, the space is so, so broad that um, there's really only time for a brief overview of what we're talking about. So first of all, there are a couple of ways of doing the, ver um, the various assurance mechanisms such as ISO and IRAP. And um, Dilbert, of course, is brilliant at presenting. Oh dear, let me just kill that. That would be lovely. Give me a moment. Didn't expect that. Of course, that's a security fail. Um, a neat example. Um, so, okay, that should now all be gone. Okay, so deal with this is nifty at, at describing these um, these issues um, and has done for many decades. And basically, there's a deal with way of doing this thing and just having it being a tick box party, and there's a proper way of doing it now. Um, I don't know how other organizations care to do this. Sometimes I have my doubts and they appear to have taken, you know, page 42 out of a Dilbert book for, um, for reference. And um, we just use Dilbert as in how not to do this. So we actually try to get benefit out of these uh, processes and actually improve our own, um, the way we do things in a technical way and also in a documentation way and also in the way that we interact with our, uh, with our clients. So I'll go through a number of different um, standards and processes that we are involved in. So ISO 27001, it's very topical for us. We're actually in the middle of our stage two audit. That means that um, in stage one, our documentation has already been reviewed. Um, that has been found okay with a couple of comments. And in stage two, the assessor would, outside of COVID times, visit our offices and just have a chat with various people. Um, they just look around as well. So if someone, for instance, goes away to see um, to see about their coffee in the kitchen and they leave their screen unlocked, then that becomes a minor nonconformity because screens should be locked if someone is not um, at their particular desk. Um, so that's just one example. Similarly, uh, you see the photo at the bottom right of the of the slide. Um, when looking at the information security policy, you know, there has been commitment from management and certain things have to be put in place that everything is safe and secure. Um, if the management office, the general manager's office were to look like this, and no, this is not a photo from our offices, um, then, you know, that would be an indication that it's not all well. So, you know, there's a broad range of things that can be uh, taken into account. Um, there are 114 controls in 14 categories. Um, and one example I've again put on the screen. So it's a fairly broad and open way of describing an information security system, um, where a system is basically a way to, you know, look at security in an organization. So when you develop a way to look at that, that is called the information security management system. So here we see password managers shall be in a particular way. It doesn't prescribe it in detail, but it is, it does say that you have to do something. With ISO, as well as uh, other ones that I'll describe, the uh, implementation is done on a security, on a risk-based, um, it, it's risk-based. So that means that when you implement a control, you're trying to get the risk, the residual risk, as low as possible. Um, we always aim for low. Um, so it can be low, medium, high, critical, you know, depending on your or your rating system that you apply, you would need to specify that as well. We always aim for low and we always aim to implement a particular control. If a control is not applicable, for instance, at Catalyst Australia, we do not um, do outsource development at all. We always um, hire directly or for, for permanent full-time uh, people, sometimes part-time and sometimes contract basis. We do not outsource to other companies for our development. So there's a control in ISO that talk about outsource development. We say this is not applicable because we never do that. So for us, everything is regarded as in scope. 
except when we have a particular justification for that. But um, other than that, um, yeah, the, the system is fairly broad, um, generic, and there's a lot of practical implementation that you then have to do after that. Then there's the ISM. Now, this one is the Australian Government Information Security Manual, which I actually regard as one of the better ones. Um, it's much more descriptive and prescriptive than ISO. Essentially, you can see it as a, a superset. Um, so if you look at ISO and then you look at ISM, you'll see that the ISM controls actually cover the various aspects of, of ISO very nicely. Um, one key difference is that when you're implementing ISM for your organization um, to get IREP certification, the IREP certification, which we'll get in a moment, to, um, it actually applies to a particular part of your um, organization. It doesn't apply to, apply to all of it. So, for instance, um, when talking about a Drupal site for a government entity, the IREP system would be that particular site the infrastructure on which it is hosted, the pipelines for the integration system that is communicating with that, the possibly the laptops of the people that do development, uh, people who access it at the back end, such as administrators and uh, content managers, um, the system administrators that um, that deal with the environment, uh, the infrastructure, um, and, and for instance, on AWS, the, the controls on there. So it is very specific to a particular environment, but obviously you can apply the ISM to your entire organization and just have the, the benefit. And that is what we have done at, uh, at Catalyst. So there are over 700 controls. Now, this actually changes monthly. There are some old controls get tossed out, some new controls get put in, and various controls get rewritten. Um, in many cases, it's not particularly drastic, but over the last year, quite a few changes have been made. Um, in particular, with regard to the um, to the cloud hosting. Um, so earlier, the ISM was very prescriptive in terms of that. And then what happened is that the cloud providers, such as Azure and, um, and AWS, would get their own certification or assurance on the ISM for IREP in, um, in that mechanism, and then anyone getting IREP certification would basically be able to use that as a component of their own certification assurance. That is no longer directly the case. Um, we kind of now have to make our own risk assessment. And in due course, what will happen is that AWS and Azure will still do those assessments and then provide clients such as us with detailed documentation on that. So that's a more detailed rather than just the final report. And then we include that in our own assessments. Now, to um, have a look at, at one of the examples here, um, you can see, I think you can see my mouse. Yes. Um, so this is one of the controls. There are not really that many. They just keep numbering. So if one gets tossed out, a new one gets put in, it gets a new number. This one happens to be a revision one, not re rephrased at any point. It comes from September 9, um, 2018. This is official. Uh, protected secret top secret. So for those security classifications, it is applicable. And then it says very specifically when multi-factor authentication is implemented, what is required with that. Basically that if you use a password and in some cases a security token, a YubiKey or a TTP from your phone, you know, like Google Authenticator, you can't be allowed to use that same password somewhere else without the security token. So that's a very, very specific uh, specification that it has there. Now, an organization can choose to not be compliant with this, um, and then it has to make a residual risk assessment. So what would be the risk of not actually implementing that or partially implementing that? Now, again, as I mentioned, Catalyst have made the choice to um, implement wherever possible and that has resulted in this. Um, so the only part of an actual IREP report that I can show you today is that little quote from our assessor. And um, that particular system was classified to, to official, which is you know kind of like the basic level in, in IREP space, um, official sensitive actually. And um, we got to 93.6% compliance. So on 700 controls, you know, there's a couple of, 
dozen controls that we weren't at that point able to implement or that we are not going to implement. And then for each of those, we would have a justification on exactly why, um, why we take that approach and make sure that the residual risk is nevertheless low because that is the objective. Um, it is important that whatever you do or don't do, you mustn't expose yourself to, to problems, whether it is organizationally or on a technical level. So that's, um, that's IREP. So the IREP program is specific to Australia and it's, um, it's run by, um, by Australian Defence Signals um, and it implements the information security manual. And then um, an assessor, again, similar, it's actually very similar to ISO in that respect. Um, in some cases you get a stage zero to look at whether an organization is ready to, to get assessed. Stage one is a documentation review. Stage two is a, as I call it, show me review. So the assessor says, well, you've stated here in your documentation that you handle this in a certain way. Um, the SSH servers are configured in this particular way. Uh, the configuration is actually prescribed by ISM. Show me. And then, you know, one of the system administrators will have to go in uh, to one of the systems and actually show that that is indeed the case. So it's actually very, very specific and prescriptive in that sense. Um, but in, in return, you get a pretty good assurance that the system is actually fairly secure rather than just on paper. So in that sense, the chances of doing IRAP, but not properly, are less high than with ISO. However, if an organization chooses to implement less and do more risk assessment in a way, then you could still get a fairly low um, compliance rating. So it's my understanding from, from assessors that typically um, the percentage of compliance is somewhere between 40 or 70%, um, which makes our 93.6% look very high. Um, I don't have insight in what other organizations do, um, but for us, it wasn't that complicated. It's a lot of work, but it was essentially what we do already well documented. And again, I'm, I'm happy to ask, uh, answer particular questions that you uh, might have, because I don't know who my audience is today. Um, you know, whether you're an executive in government trying to all, um, arrange something or whether you're a techie uh, looking at this from the other side. Um, I'm expecting essentially all, uh, all um, types of questions, and that's perfectly fine. Um, I see a typo on the page here, of course, that's NIST. Um, so when implementing our information security systems, we take a close look at the NIST publications, particularly 863 series. Um, the reason we do that is because typically it kind of runs ahead of some other ones. For instance, in NIST, the um, identity proofing or the authentication, um, those processes are already described in a way that is more up to date with how things work now. Um, some of you may have seen the XKCD cartoon about the fact that a password that consists of um, four individual words. I need to kill another app. There you go, the things we do today. Um, the th so that a password that consists of multiple words is much better in terms of being secure and actually possibly being remembered, although I do recommend using a password manager, um, then requiring a number of letters and then uppercase, lowercase um, numbers, special characters, it becomes very arduous for people to use. Um, it ten tends to get circumvented. You know, if you require people to use numbers, they use 0.1 the first one, and then in three months, if you require them to change the password again, they'll use 0.2. That's entirely predictable, and it doesn't actually make things uh, better and more secure. What it does is it creates a predictable, predictable path for computers to actually brute force these systems, and that is exactly what happens. So NIST describes password security as if it has to be remembered by a person, it actually needs to be easily remembered. Um, and it actually needs to be really secure. And we work inside Catalyst on the basis of bits of entropy. A password needs to have at least 65 bits of entropy. Um, so basically using a word and then replacing some of the letters with um, you know, the, nu the numbers, like Catalyst, you could replace the A's with a four. Um, that doesn't make the password any more secure. In fact, in some cases, less so. So those are the interesting things that we look at. So 
NIST we use to create the best practice on top of ISM and ISO. So what we have done in terms of implementing um, ISM is we've said we're not compliant with this control. We actually implement a superset, and that is NIST in this case. Okay, I need to click there. OWASP. So OWASP we use um, internally to review our own applications to see whether it actually has been um, developed with secure coding practices. And we also use that for external applications, such as Drupal, to, um, to see whether all is well there. Now, Drupal and, and GovCMS are pretty decent. Um, it depends a little bit on which plugins, uh, you know, which extra projects you use in there, but overall, it's actually very, very good. Um, however, it does depend on configuration, both of Drupal itself, as well as the web server environment. So that all comes into play when seeing, um, when reviewing whether something is actually secure. We also get, and that is a requirement generally for at least IRAP, um, for a particular system, for a particular environment, we get an external vulnerability assessment done for um, by pen testing organization. We do that internally ourselves, but you do want that external assurance to, you know, assure to the client that you haven't just done an internal tick box. All right. So very quickly, an overview. And again, I'm happy to share these slides as far as you haven't recorded it already. Um, this provides a quick overview of how we build our, our infrastructure. We build across different availability zones in, in Sydney. So these are three different locations at AWS. In Sydney, we're all hosted in Australia for those applications. So it's scalable, it's secure because of the way we set it up for IREP. Uh, environments, all this is within a virtual private cloud um, and then in separate segments of that. Um, only this segment is actually available from the outside. The others cannot be. Um, it is resilient because if any of these systems goes down or a component inside, that doesn't matter. It is okay. Within the components also we scale. So there can be many, many dozens of, um, of web servers happening here. There can be many, many more database slaves and, and servers around. So that's that's how that works. We use Linux. Um, of course, we use the AWS technology and we use a lot of Docker containers. And internally in our organization, we use uh, we all use Linux-based um, laptops and infrastructure. Um, as CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer of Catalyst, that makes me very happy because about 95% of the security alerts that fly past are not applicable to me, very simply because I don't use Windows. Um, and the final bit, we, um, of course, keep an eye on things. And that is very important, both for IRAP and ISO. They get reassessed, but even if they didn't um, get reassessed, we want to do right by our clients, obviously. So the monitoring of systems is very important, keeping up to date with vulnerability alerts and then doing regular updates. So that is built into our pipeline system. And, um, you know, we do regular security updates, both of the, under, of the underlying platform as well as the uh, as the versions of Drupal and its um, and its components. All right, I've run a bit over time for my talk, which means I have less time for questions. But as I mentioned, I'm quite happy to uh, to answer more after that. Um, so Timothy Cosgrove asked, "Are there any ISM controls that I found to be to be particularly problematic for Drupal?" No, I honestly have to say I haven't. Um, so we've worked with Drupal and we've worked with Moodle Learning Management System and Totara, also Learning Management System, but more corporately based. Um, there's nothing particularly complicated. The things to look out for are things like password controls, but it's not difficult to actually implement that properly. In many cases, um, in corporate environments, you actually use single sign-ons. Um, so you essentially log on via SAML or LDAP rather than Drupal directly, which makes it you know, you kind of outsource that problem, but you still have to deal with it. Um, how do we keep staff up to date with controls? Um, am I still allowed to go? <laughs> um, we don't give um, details on this um, to to staff directly. Um, so I have CISO and I have someone who works with me for, for compliance um, and, and risk. We look at these things and then um, we look at the context within our organization. And 
what happens then is if we think something is relevant in terms of change, we write up a work request for the sysadmins to follow up on um, and actually make a change in configuration or you know work towards a different way of doing it. And that gets to start discussed with our operations manager. Um, but that, that's essentially the way we do it. It is completely impractical to have all your staff up to date for all these things. That's just not the way um, you can generally work. You really need compliance or security people who are across this. And I can't say it's a joy and a pleasure to read all this on a regular basis, but you know, it's part of the work and you can actually make it fun. Okay, other questions? Yes, we shield our team where possible. <laughs> um, Yes, I mean, why should we all go through the pain? Um, you know, I'll um, I'll happily read that, and so does my uh, my colleague Claire, who does the um, who does the um, compliance and risk assessment. And then we we share with our team as necessary. And of course, we need to do internal training, and then those things need to be read. Okay, I hear we have to wrap up. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to to follow up and answer more questions. Thank you. <laughs>